Okay, welcome back to the Non-Serbian Podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, um, and now I have in the internet studio with me, Yusuf, who doesn't feel like sharing his last name, and we love that here. We're fine with that. Um, he's a video essayist, blogger, first year law student at Harvard Law School, and Bastiat Fellow at the Mercatus Center. That's all pretty legit. Uh, his blog, Long-Term Lib- Liberalism, focuses on the intersection of existential risk, classical liberalism, and effective altruism. His YouTube channel, Leveler, also covers similar topics. I was enjoying that earlier today myself. Um, His other interests include artificial intelligence, emerging technology, science, philosophy, economics, and music. Um, And it's fun to have him here today. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So... There's a bunch of areas, and honestly, reading that bio, if someone like me is listening, they might not know exactly what several of those things are, (laughs) though they might know the separate words, like I had to look up effective altruism, but it's kind of what it says on the tin, like it's, it's, you know, it's what you think it is. Um, But I kind of want to start, let's just start with how you currently identify politically, what was your journey to where you are now, and what's with the... um, the video I watched where you have an ANCAP past guy past <laughs> yourself talking to you. Very sensible past, maybe too sensible for, for an ANCAP. And I can say <laughs> that because I was one. Until, well, until yeah, Cantwell. exactly. Sorry, exactly. That's, that's the idea. We all have an ANCAP past, right? <laughs> um, so basically where I am now politically is I like, in general, the broad category of classical liberalism of liberalism even, I might go so far as to say. I I like that category because it, well, for one thing, I don't like pinning myself down to one specific ideology uh, within that because I think liberalism and classical liberalism itself offers so much guidance and so much useful analysis about how the world works and how government works, the importance of individual dignity and liberty that I personally uh, don't, I'm not super confident beyond a lot of that stuff. So in other words, I'm not confident enough in any particular version of that to say that I am a more specific version than classical liberal. So that is kind of intentional. Another aspect to that is that I do think there's this tendency, and we can kind of talk about this, but I think there's a tendency, uh, it's a very natural tendency to, you know, once you have a very specific political label, you then engage in confirmation bias and you kind of seek out what other people of that label are also saying and what they think. And then you interpret new information through the lens of that label. And obviously, to some extent, this is unavoidable. So I'm not one of those people who says, oh, I don't have an ideology, right? Right, I'm, right. I'm very clearly I don't trust a... those people. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Those people are usually just not self-aware of what their ideology mm-hmm. really is. So I, I will say, you know, I am a classical liberal. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that. But I think that beyond that, the where the reason why I kind of came to this general classical liberal perspective is because I've just reflected a lot on how complicated the world is, how little I know about how the various aspects of the world work. And for reasons like that, I've kind of just grown increasingly skeptical of theories of kind of grand theories that that are uh all-encompassing or claim to have solutions to, you know, a lot of, I guess I should say, all-encompassing political theories. And part of the reason to be a liberal or to be a classical liberal is to support pluralism and diversity because you don't know, you know, quote unquote, what the right answer is. So I think that is part of why I have become less interested in saying, oh, I'm this very specific variant of like classical liberal or whatever. But if you had to pin me down, it would probably be something like liberal-tarian or something like that. <laughs> you know, any term you pick is going to get ruined by somebody. Um, That's true. <laughs> classical liberal sounds sounded great until, you know, Dave Rubin at all rolled into <laughs> town and started <laughs> saying it incessantly. But does that skepticism apply to something like anarchism, which theoretically doesn't have a lot of ideology? I mean, it does, but it doesn't. You yeah. Know? Or, or I mean, skepticism of central planning or anything like that. Yeah, it does apply to anarchism. So I had a long conversation with, with Zach Woodman, um, who I guess for anyone who doesn't know is also the host of 
Mutual Exchange Radio with the Center for Stateless Society. And we talked about political radicalism. And, and we had some back and forth, but I think at the end of it, we managed to agree that we should have increased skepticism the less empirical evidence there is for any given idea. So if, if a certain idea doesn't have any empirical evidence, it's never been tested before, or at least you know, the last time it was tested, it was tested on an incredibly small scale, or it was tested 300 years ago or something. So the, the less empirical evidence there is for an idea, the more skeptical we should be. Now, that doesn't mean that the idea is not true. It could absolutely be true. Ideas that have never, absolutely never been tried, ideas that have never been thought of can be the best arrangements of political, uh, polit- they could be the best political arrangements, they can be the best scientific ideas, right? Um, so we should, of course, maintain openness to weird ideas. But I think that the less evidence you have, the more skeptical one should be. I, I firmly, I, I've kind of arrived at that position. And because anarchism just has remarkably little evidence that it would actually work, I do not identify as an anarchist. Now, it's also interesting in terms of like the identity of anarchist, because a lot of people, a lot of anarchists who I've talked to, a lot of self-identified anarchists would say, I'm not claiming it would work. I'm just saying that there is no deontological moral legitimacy to the state and there's no like first principles like moral reason to do what the state says it's true and and you know and like but like i guess my thing is i agree with that i just don't think that i just don't think that if if you agree with that then you should call yourself an anarchist because i mean this is kind of another point a a kind of a somewhat tangential point but you know i I think that and i don't have a super well well well-developed view on like philosophy of language or whatever but I do think that when we use terms, we should use them to try to gain more clarity into how, into what we think, how our mind works, and what we mean when we say things. And I think that when you use a term like anarchism, and you self-identify as that, and yet you don't think that anarchism would actually work, I feel that that is embodying a lack of clarity in your, in your, in the way you use words. And so I kind of just feel like. The, the average person or even like the average educated person, if you ask them, hey, does an anarchist believe that anarchism would work as a political system? I think the average person would be like, well, yeah, isn't that, isn't that what it means to be an anarchist? I think the average person might look at anarchy in the streets of wherever again and think that, I mean, I would take issue with the level of sophistication needed to even realize that anarchism is a philosophy, not what those you know, college kids are doing that I don't like. That's fair like enough. That. But I mean, don't, don't, but don't you think that if you asked even the average, I mean, okay, I could be, I could be wrong about this. So I'm not going to state this like a claim. It's a genuine question. Um, if you ask the average political philosopher, if someone does not believe that anarchism could be, could work, should they be considered an anarchist? My sense is that the average, you know, political philosopher or whatever, would say no. And I could yeah. be wrong about that, but that's, that's why I just fair. don't think. Yeah. yeah. So I just, I just think that if you don't think that anarchism could work, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I don't think anarchism could work. So I'm not going to call myself an anarchist. That doesn't mean that I don't take it seriously as a, as a political philosophy. It doesn't mean that I don't think that anarchists have contributed amazing, amazing um, content for uh, like, you know, ha- ha- push the boundaries of political theory, of economics, of a whole wide variety of domains. Doesn't mean that I that I don't think they're really smart anarchists. It's just that I don't think it would work. So I don't identify as one. So, yeah. So before you tell me what might work, can you tell me a little bit about who has, who influences you now, who influenced you before and your different ideas? Like what are some, drop, drop some names for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. People as far back as like, I would say, you know, Thomas Paine, uh, John Stuart Mill, those people have influenced my general liberalism. Paine, Mill, Locke. Yeah. So those are the people who have influenced my most general takes on liberalism, like, you know, the harm principle, the importance of diversity of ideas, experimentation, allowing a wide variety of, of different perspectives to have this shared coexistence. The importance of that, I think. But then going more specifically, I have also been, you know, I have a libertarian history as well, like a libertarian streak. I still think that I have like libertarian instincts, so to speak. And so definitely influenced by uh, Robert Nozick, definitely influenced by Mary Rothbard, also influenced by, you know, you know, Benjamin Tucker, who else? I mean, just, yeah, a whole host. I would say like, you know, a lot of the typical 
you know, Lysander Spooner, the the individualists of the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. I did I did I mention Rothbard? I think I might have. You did. Yes, I did. He's someone who I, you know, as many people do, have mixed feelings about. You got, <laughs> um, oh my god, don't trust anybody who doesn't, I mean... Who's like, just, who, oh yeah, I agree. Well, anyone who says, oh, I agree with everything Rothbard said, well, Rothbard contradicts himself, so... That's just There's about awesome. five or six Rothbards over the years, and I exactly. like about... One to one and, one and, and a half. half of them. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, literally, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> but, okay, but here's the thing. I have a lot of respect for the idea of kind of being a heterodox, unorthodox person who is able to have a large influence on a lot of, you know, intellectual history, right? And, you know, Rothbard's one of those people, he didn't really have, he wasn't really like formally accepted within mainstream economics. And there are, of course, some good reasons for that. But he still managed to have some very good ideas and, you know, certainly influenced the American libertarian movement in a very interesting way. There's a part of me that's like, oh, that's that's kind of cool. Even if I, uh, of course, there are a lot of takes of his that I think are I find repulsive, but like, yeah. there's still some very cool elements to that, to that kind of story. And so, I guess what made me think of that was that you look at someone like Robert Nozick, who was very well respected, um, you know, Harvard philosophy professor, and his book. Uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia was written largely as a response to Murray Rothbard, even though Murray Rothbard was like not so well respected among traditional academia. I was going to read more of your Substack, and I got I got just kind of distracted by the videos that you have <laughs> on the channel. Um, you have a video talking about the mistakes you made in your um, twenty twenty video about Black Lives Matter and police and things like that. Yep. Um, you talk about. Oh my gosh, soldier versus scout mentality, which I had never mm-hmm. heard that before. I like I like that um, quite a bit. And you rag on uh, even contrapoints uh, in the one video, who I always liked and thought usually doesn't fall into the trap of of just being sort of like what I know is what I know, and I'm not going to look outward or with any empathy and stuff. Um, so basically, what are you trying to do with your YouTube video? I mean, I think I'm going to point people there again at the end of this talk, but what's the goal over there? Yeah, totally. So just to go a little bit more deeply, you referenced the scout versus soldier mindset. And for anyone who doesn't know, the idea is that when we are are talking about ways of looking at the world, ways of looking at the space of ideas, there are really two archetypes that we could analogize to. So there are two kind of broad ways of looking at the world. There is the archetype of the scout on it, like a battlefield, right? The job of the scout, a a scout is a good scout if they accurately map out the territory, if they venture out and see what is actually true. They are not a good scout if they make up stories about what the terrain looks like and they lie about it or whatever, uh, or lie to themselves. That's not a good scout. A good scout is someone who tries to see the world as it is. If something, if they see something that they didn't expect, rather than getting angry, they get curious. Ooh, why is this something that I was wrong about? That's very interesting. Let me adjust my map. Okay. The soldier, on the other hand, as one could imagine, is someone who, uh, you know, a good soldier is someone who fights for their ideas. They do not question, like when they when they see something that disagrees with their perspective, they get angry, they want to fight. They want Their goal is to win. Their goal is not to understand how the world is. The goal is to win. And so the problem is that everyone has a soldier in them to some extent. And there are, of course, gradations of how scout-like we all are. But we should strive to be more scout-like. We should strive to actually understand the world as it is, instead of trying to analyze the world from our preconceived biases instead of trying to be a soldier. And essentially, when we encounter information that we disagree with, we get angry and we try to fight against it rather than keeping an open mind and wondering to yourself, huh, that's very interesting. Why do people believe that? And so there are various ways to try to cultivate the scout mindset in yourself. One of my favorite ways is the idea of the ideological Turing test. And I kind of alluded to this. I talked about it in my video. Um, And the point of the video, really, the argument that I was making was that if you are going to go out there and say, you know, write a book about something that you believe or make videos about what you believe, you are obligated to understand the realm of ideas as accurately as possible. You have to understand what your opponents, what your ideological opponents believe. You have to be able to explain your opponent's position so well 
that if someone didn't know what you actually thought, they could easily be convinced that you actually, you know, let, let's say you are not a conservative, you should be able to argue for conservatism, or at least like know what a conservative sounds like so well that someone who didn't know you would not be sure if you are or are not a conservative, right? <laughs> and the idea is that if you can do that, and if you can do that, especially at the level of more sophisticated arguments, if you could be really charitable to your opponents, that's how you know that you are approaching the truth. Like if you cannot do that, then you are less likely to actually believe what is true. Now, the problem with that is that almost nobody actually does that. And therefore, almost everybody who kind of broadcasts their opinions online, including myself, and you know, everyone does this to some extent, but I think we should strive to be better. The problem is that almost everybody, when they broadcast their opinions online or in person or whatever, but especially now online, what they're doing is they are saying shit without being sure that what they're saying is actually true. And that means that you could be accidentally spreading really bad and harmful ideas. And that is really, really bad. And so the reason why I made the video was because many people in like online politics are in the business of talking about what we might call object level facts about politics. Object level meaning like, what are the specific issues we're talking about? Are we in favor of abortion rights? Are we against abortion rights? Are we in favor of deregulating solar industry, whatever, object level issues. But Mm -hmm. very few people are actually talking about and thinking about meta level issues, which is how should we actually approach the question of how to discover what is true about the world and including in politics? What are, the pra- what are the behaviors that we should be engaged in? And my claim is that there are certain green flags for content creators and just for people in general, where if people engage in certain kinds of behaviors, for example, they are charitable to their opponents, they can articulate what their opponents believe in a way that is, is charitable and accurate. If, if a person engages in those green flag behaviors, that doesn't mean they're right about whatever they believe, but it means they're more likely to be correct. On the other hand, if someone engages in red flag behaviors, for example, they are just kind of butchering what their opponents actually believe. They are creating straw man caricatures. They're not actually engaging with the strongest versions of their opponent's arguments. Those are red flag behaviors. And it doesn't mean that they're wrong, but it means that they are less likely to be correct. And so this is what you might call meta level thinking about mm-hmm. you know, how we th- how we should think about and how we should communicate about politics. And I just, I see so little of that, which is why I felt the need to make a video about it and why I also included some um, mistakes that I made uh, in my previous video about Black Lives Matter. Some of the last things you were saying sort of implies an open mind to a fault, perhaps. And how, you know, have I ever carefully considered Nazism? Like whether, <laughs> hmm. Right, right. Uh, do I, I mean, it, it, I always sort of argue that everyone has a line somewhere about something. And that's been a popular line, especially in, you know, anarchist circles. So that's a good, yeah, that's a very good question. A very good objection. You, so no one can have a complete, complete, a blank slate, open mind to anything and everything. First of all, it's not possible. But second of all, it's not desirable. So what you kind of have to do is you have to weigh how seriously you take an idea based on, kind of probability and consequences. So in other words, you should feel more comfortable believing in ideas, even if you're not sure about what what the opponents believe, you should feel more comfortable in believing ideas when they are more likely to be true. So for instance, if there is like an overwhelming expert consensus in something, you don't really, you don't have to entertain the opposite viewpoint, or at least your obligation to do so is much, much lower, which is why it's like, oh, should you entertain Holocaust denial? Should you entertain like moon landing was faked or flat earth? It's like, no. Although I do like to think about those things for fun because I want to know how to disprove them. But that's just, I don't Mm -hmm. think you have to. That's more of just like a a fun exercise. Like I love, (laughs) I love thinking about how we know the moon landing was not faked. I think that's like so fun to think about, but you don't, you don't have to, right? It's not even, I wouldn't even recommend it. I would just say, you, you don't have to because if there's like overwhelming evidence or overwhelming expert consensus in something, that doesn't mean that it's guaranteed to be true by any means. But again, it just means that it's more likely to be true. And so you your obligation to entertain the opposite view is lower. And then another example of that would be consequences, where sometimes the consequences of entertaining an idea on one side are much worse than on the other side. You have to be very 
very careful about what you decide is so obviously false that you don't want to entertain it. And my fear, and I think this is true, that many people will just basically do that to whatever position they happen to not agree with. And they won't actually be like, they won't actually take do the careful process of thinking like, how how bad are the consequences of, of this idea? How likely is the probability of this idea being true? Like, I think that's the kind of work you have to do before you say, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to take this seriously. And so, therefore, at the end of all this, yeah, Nazis, yeah, you don't have to take that seriously for the reasons that I said, you know, the consequences, the probabilities, all that, right? Right. But, like, I don't know, like, conservatism, you know, or, or at least some, depending on what you mean by that, right? Some people, they say conservative right. and they're, they're actually Nazis. But I just mean, like, you know, <laughs> a good faith, a good faith conservative or a good faith liberal or a good faith socialist or whatever, you know? Like, you should be very careful before you say that's so beyond the pale that I'm just not going to seriously entertain the idea. I'm trying to decide how well I could defend sort of mainstream conservatism if I... I'd say I could do it moderately. Better than, you know, some people who are not that, as I am not. Yeah, I mean, it's good for everyone to do, if for no other reason than if you truly believe that an idea is wrong... Your being able to kind of put yourself in that mindset is going to make it so much easier for you to fight against those bad ideas. I mean, it's what they do in debate classes, right? You know, you yeah. it doesn't matter what you think. you got to take a side. If you understand the reasoning process that a person goes through to arrive at their conclusion, then you're also better to, you're, it's also easier for you to figure out how to argue against them or how to fight against them. Um, if you do find that belief to be particularly like bad or even repulsive. Um, so in that sense, in that sense, I would actually say that we should not have any sympathy for like the Nazi position, for instance, we should not believe that we should not be like, oh, well, let's try to like, we don't, we, we should be neutral. We don't know if that's <laughs> right. Right. But, but I do think that if you want to fight against Nazism, you should have a gr- good idea of why people are being convinced by Nazi arguments. And that, that just makes it easier for you to fight against it. So so I, I'll say real quick, in, in, in general, there are two kinds of rationality or two categories that you could think of to divide different types of rationality. There's instrumental rationality, which is the rationality that helps you achieve your goals. And then there's epistemic rationality, which is the rationality that helps you actually determine what is true about the world. We're all really in this process of trying to, like the world is extremely complicated and weird. And we are all in this position where we just don't know how it works. But what we do in response to that is not to throw up our hands, is to try to build models of the world, create maps of the territory. And we don't want to confuse the map for the territory. We don't want to think that the map of the forest is actually the forest itself. But we want to create maps so that we can make predictions about the world, so that we can anticipate things that will happen. And the better our model is at making predictions, the more likely it is to be close to reality. And so this is true of like politics. This is true of really everything I would say. And so we should be conscious of trying to make sure that our map actually maps onto the world instead of um, just being very convinced that whatever map we think we have because, you know, someone sounded really persuasive arguing it to us or because we had some you know, some gut level intuition, which in in some cases you should take seriously, but in some cases you should think critically about. Um, We need to make sure that our map actually corresponds to the territory, corresponds to the world. Let's pretend that we're more at odds than I, you know, I think we actually are, or even the fact that this is, you know, an anarchist uh, podcast and uh, media collective, which, you know, it's a moral philosophy and, you know, I think you know, things work. I think it mostly works. I, but I also mm. think it's moral, you know, I think in a way that I couldn't prove in a mm. way that scientists can prove stuff. So, I mean, are of you, of course, yeah. What is the difference between all of what you said and just like the sort of ut- like utilitarianism and other just sort of like, well, we, we did the figures and this is the best for, the, for 90% of people. And Sort of what I, yeah, what I think of yeah, this yeah, sort yeah. of a drudgery, which is my bias and sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's, it's good that you bring that up because I should clarify that when I say that, when I say that we're making maps and, t- and like through our political ideas, I'm talking specifically about empirical questions, like questions about what is true about reality. Uh, I'm not saying that you can discover moral truths in the same way that you can discover scientific truths. 
that like I, I like to think of it as having tools in your toolbox. Um, you want to have you want to have epistemic rationality and try to understand the world as it is. Try to understand what your opponents believe. Try to navigate like the realm of ideas. Right. It's like if you're in a forest, you could either pick a direction and say, oh, I, I think this is the right way to go to to get out of this forest. Like let's say you're lost. You can either pick a direction and say, I, I'm just going to go this way, or you can try to look at your surroundings. You can try to draw a map take out a compass or whatever. And if you do those things, take out a map and compass, whatever, that doesn't mean that you are guaranteed to find your way home, but that means that you're more likely to. The reason I bring up the tools thing is because you can use these tools regardless of what your ideology is. Mm -hmm. It's kind of orthogonal. It's separate from the question of like what your preferred ideology is. It might be related. I I would think that it's related. Uh, Like I think that the more like the more appreciative you are of like epistemic humility and, and rationality and whatever, the more uh, the more you think about those things. I, I guess yeah, the more appreciative you are about like yeah epistemic humility, about the scout mindset, about trying to craft a map to correspond to the territory. I think you, the less likely you are to believe in some of the crazier ideologies, uh, some of the ones that are just much less likely to be true. So it does conspiracies or well yeah conspiracies or you know i would also say that a lot of ideologies kind of rely on conspiratorial thinking yeah certainly to a point yeah like i mean okay if you talk to like a fucking tanky right like (laughs) they they are fucking conspiracy theorists about about (laughs) a lot of right like it's it's like talking to a like a moon landing truther sometimes and same Mm -hmm. thing when you're talking to a fascist they actually they think and talk Exactly like conspiracy theorists. In fact, they are almost always conspiracy theorists. Um, oh, absolutely. With, with right. fascists, with, Nazis. Yeah, with fascists. And yeah, it's like, uh, you know, the Jewish conspiracy or whatever. So I would actually say that conspiracy, like, you know, to the extent that you have these tools, you're less likely to be, believe in conspiracies. And so you're less likely to believe in what I would say are the truly crazy ideologies um, that are just not backed by like history or, you know, common sense. Uh, yeah, I would say mostly history and evidence, right? But you can absolutely be an anarchist. and and have an appreciation for these tools. You can be a libertarian, you can be a socialist, you can be a conservative, you can be a liberal, right? It's like if we're talking about like the scientific method, you can be a a Christian and be and and believe in the scientific method. You can be a a libertarian, you can be a utilitarian, right? It doesn't, these things are not in conflict with one another. It's just about trying to gain a better appreciation for how the world works. There are many people who understand, you know, like the scout mindset, things like that, who self ID as anarchists. And, you know, I'm friends with many of them. So, so there's nothing in what I'm saying that like precludes anarchism. Although my personal position is that some of it does inform why I'm like very skeptical of anarchism, but Mm. I can also, but it's, it's the kind of thing where I can see why someone would disagree. And I don't think they are like irrational for disagreeing with me. But it's it's a way that I like I do think that some of these tools like epistemic humility, like the point we were making earlier about evidence, I do think that that points in the direction of not being an anarchist, at least in the sense of thinking that it would work. But in the sense that you bring up with like the mor- morality of it, that is a different sense in which you cannot just like, you know, derive your morality from just looking at evidence or whatever. I'm not one of those people. Among, you know, among radicals of all stripes and, you know, thinking maybe of anarchists as usual, but like liberalism yeah. is seen as extremely moderate, centrist, mm-hmm. gradualist to a fault. And compared to some people, like I had a talk with Corey Massimino um, on one of my first podcast on here about this, talking about January 6th and sort of what we object to about that, even as we really dislike some of the institutional norms that were, you know, supposedly imperiled by these, by the people on January 6th. Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, can you find somewhere that's not sort of timid with, 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 you know, with liberalism? You know, liberalism in terms, in terms of the way that I'm using it is a general category for a, a large bucket of beliefs, including like there are liberal anarchists and there have been historically liberal anarchists i know like three of them there. yeah exactly right <laughs> so so like by liberalism what i mean is i'm referring to the idea of equality um, of of rights you know people mm-hmm. having equal rights of having some sort of limits 
on government power of having some kind of rule of law, whether that is through an explicit like state or even if that is through anarchist governance, um, you still want to have the rule of law. Um, you still want to have like equality under the law. Those are liberal ideas. I think pluralism is really key to my understanding of liberalism. And it's been independently discovered throughout history, right? When Lao Tzu was talking about having you know, fewer armaments and fewer weapons being produced by the state and having fewer like restrictions on people's freedom resulted in more prosperity and flourishing, right? But the basic ideas are, are that, first of all, people have vast differences in, in what they believe to be the good life in what they believe to be the origins of morality, whether it's because they are disagreeing about religion or they're disagreeing about something else. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that despite that, we all have a mutual shared interest in cooperating and living in a uh, society together and um, coexisting, basically. And so the idea is that we discover the norms and the values that can help us uh, coexist despite differences we might have in our our idea of the good life. That's kind of just the really, really general view, but that's kind of what I see as the core of liberalism. And so from that, you derive, this is why certain rights are super important. This is why we have rights, because it allows us to maximally allow different kinds of like, you know, lifestyles or beliefs about the world to coexist with one another. And so, yeah, I want to clarify that like my liberalism is not like the, the, the mushy, like the, what do you call it? Cushy, mushy. I don't know. One of those words of like, it's not like fucking Hillary Clinton or something. Right. Um, right. I, I believe like, you know, where, what, what radical conclusions can you derive from that? I mean, depends what you mean by radical, like is mm-hmm. legal, is legalizing all drugs radical? I think that legalizing all drugs is just extremely straightforward. It's just very clear. There's a very clear line from liberalism like the actual fundamental ideas of liberalism to like legalizing all drugs or to letting in millions more immigrants or to a lot of things that people would consider radical. So I don't know, like what's my most radical belief? Like I definitely have become a lot more skeptical of a lot of like radical ideas because of the whole, my whole uh, reasoning about, you know, I just think that the less evidence that a certain idea has doesn't mean that it's wrong, but it just means that we should be more skeptical of it. And so I just don't have the confidence, the level of confidence to say that here is some arrangement of society that is just extremely d- different from where we're currently at. I think it would be a good idea for us to move from here to there. And one thing I will say also, just as like a, a side note, one of my objections to anarchism for like the longest time has actually been tail risks and like existential risks. I think the the moral anarchism thing, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like, let's actually abolish the state. Mm -hmm. That idea, I think, I've just not heard a convincing story of what you do with the tens of thousands of thermonuclear weapons, who gets them and how, how do you coordinate the like collective action problems that that creates, not to mention the possibility of other people creating weapons of mass destruction. How do you prevent them from doing that? Uh, How do you coordinate that? Right. Like there, there are just so many things that like, especially when it comes to emergent technologies and existential risk, where I'm like really uncomfortable with radically changing the political arrangements without having a very very robust plan about how exactly uh, we plan on addressing these issues. And so until I can find a plan that seems really robust against some pretty like low hanging fruit objections, uh, at, at the very least, I'm not comfortable being like, yeah, I endorse, like I'm an anarchist or, 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 or for that matter, I am a, like, I want any, like, you know, radical change in some respect is is good and necessary. But when you talk about sufficiently radical change, you just ha- there are some very important questions that you have to be able to answer, in, in my opinion, before you can justify that. Like revolution, for instance, you could talk about revolution as an example of what I'm saying. Like there could be all kinds of revolutions. You could have a socialist revolution, a communist or a, a, a fascist, unfor- like, you know, all kinds of revolutions that are possible. I think that I'm skeptical of, especially of a nuclear power. I'm skeptical of revolutions per se. I, Me too. I yeah, like, yeah, I am just not in the, just like the. I just think these are very obvious concerns that have to be like thought through. Like you know, like the nuclear weapons thing. Not to mention things in the future, where if you can't answer those simple questions, I'm just thoroughly unimpressed with like the belief that. Um, 
yeah, like a revolution is a good idea, not to mention the question of what percentage of the population would be on board, what is the probability that this would actually turn out well, mm -hmm. right? What is the probability this would result in a stable state that is like better than where we are currently, especially when you have an appreciation for the fact that we are living in times of unprecedented prosperity. Like if you just look at the long history of the human species. No one likes talking about that because <laughs> pessimism is a huge plague, I think. In all political circles, it's yeah the dominant feeling, I think, and probably has been for most of history. Yeah. And I think there are reasons for that. Like, you know, people talk about, I don't know how skeptical, I, I, I kind of like how intuitively think that evolutionary psychology makes sense, but I know that people are skeptical, but like, mm. if, if you think about it from that perspective, it's like, you know, I mean, forget about evolutionary psychology. It, just think about how norms change over time. It, the person who was warning you about danger, you were more likely to trust than the person who's like, oh, everything's fine. Don't worry about anything. Because if you're right. a species that's not looking over your shoulder, you're not going to, you know, hide away from the lion or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it makes <laughs> sense that people are, are pessimistic. I, I do think it's important to, like, disaggregate different kinds of pessimism. Like, there are and there are some ways in which I am kind of pessimistic, but yeah. I'm not pessimistic about the question of, like, like, if we're talking about the world in general, is the world in general better now than it was 300 years ago? I would actually say probably not. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But we have to make that case for me. Okay, I don't know. well, let's let me let me clarify. If we're talking about is the world for humans better overall than it was 300 years ago, I would say absolutely easily. Okay. Yeah. But the fact that there are 60 billion factory farmed and land animals who are oh. being tortured every year and dying every year, I just feel like that is that that weighs on me a lot. Um, uh, so I'm not for that reason. I think that like you know the fact that in every two years, the total number of humans who have ever lived, that number of animals is, is is tortured and killed in factory farms. That, I think, is a very strong reason to think that, okay, we, we may not be living in a better world overall. But then again, we are also experiencing trends that could, if they go well, help reverse that in the future where, you know, if we can create alternatives to, if we can create meat without having to kill animals, basically, then that is, that could alleviate that problem that could potentially eliminate that problem so i think if the human race survives long enough we're gonna look look back at factory farming and feel really bad and think how did we let that happen yeah but i think yeah. we have to get i have no sense of how long i think that would take and how many things i think would have to go right in the world but i do think that that's that's a possible vision of the future yeah and one thing I will say, if I'm thinking about what is the most important thing that libertarians or, or anarchists or classical liberals need to reckon with and need to understand, I think it would probably be the technological changes that we could experience in the very short term future. And I bring that up because it relates to the question of how pessimistic we should be. Like, you know, I, I think that humans are doing way better now than we were hundreds of years ago. I think that animals are doing way worse on uh, non-human animals. But I do think that there is a serious risk, a very serious risk, that humanity might not survive this century. <laughs> what, what's, the, what's the risk? I mean, climate change is obviously so, okay. happening. But is it the so, robots? Is it... <laughs> if we're talking about... So we talked a little bit about rationality and like political rationality, which I, I'm very interested in. And we talked, we actually didn't talk about effective altruism. We could talk about that later. This relates to those things because if you're really trying to do the most good that you can in the world, one thing that you have to be very cognizant of are risks to the long-term future of mm -hmm. civilization. There's this idea, long-termism, that is becoming more popular nowadays. There are various stronger and weaker versions of it. I find that when people criticize it, they usually only criticize like the most extreme versions of it. But the general idea is just that the well-being of the distant future should be a key moral priority of our time. And if you take that idea seriously, and you know what, even if you don't take that idea seriously, even if you're just focused on people who are alive today and their children and their grandchildren, you eventually come, if we're trying to figure out how to do the most good, 
there are certain things we can do, like, you know, improve global health, which is extremely important. There are other things we can do, like reduce factory farming. There are other things we can do, like criminal justice reform, like reducing the probability of warfare. Mm -hmm. But, and I think that warfare actually does relate to what I'm about to say. But I think one of the most important things that you end up realizing or you end up seeing when you seriously think about how to do the most good is the question of how to prevent catastrophic scenarios to the human species or even to like life on this planet. There are many good reasons in general to believe that we are living in the most dangerous century in human history. Part of that is so I, I can give like a high level ar- argument and then we can talk about like more specific examples. But the high level argument is basically that, so we, you know, I, I know you were like, you know, people don't like thinking about the long-term history of humanity. I, I love thinking about that shit. I think it's like so important. But like, if we think about the human species, it's, it's existed for say 200,000, 300,000 years, depending on how you define, you know, homo sapiens. In that time, in all of those 300,000 years, we have not had stable agrarian civilization for more than 10,000 years about. And so for the overwhelming majority, like 95% or whatever of our existence, we lived as hunter gatherers. We did not live as, you know, doing, you know, high yield agriculture and whatever. Even if we're just looking at the era of agriculture, which is 10,000 years, that is still a tiny percentage of our existence. That is not what we so-called like evolved to do. If you plot like the amount of wealth that existed in the world for all of history, even just in the last 10,000 years, it's basically a completely flat line if you looked at, you know, how wealthy is every person uh, on average, like the, per person, how much wealth exists, it's basically less than $2 a day adjusted for like inflation and, you know, modern GDP, whatever, until you get to the year 1800 and then it fucking skyrockets, it shoots up. Mm-hmm. It's like a hockey stick. That's like the hockey stick curve. This mm-hmm. is the great enrichment, right? A lot of people, like a lot of anarchists and classical liberals have talked about this. But I think what gets less talked about or appreciated is that this rapid change is so weird. We are living in super weird times because now we're not talking about 5% of human history. We're talking about like one less than 1% of all human history. Actually, less than one tenth of 1%. We've existed in a time of just rapid, rapid economic growth where things are changing really quickly and things are, in general, are accelerating. The question is... Will our technological capabilities advance faster than our wisdom? So will our power grow faster than our wisdom? Will our ability to create methods of destruction grow faster than our ability to prevent destruction? And just from a very, very high level, I know this is like a very simple way of putting it, but like it's easier to break a glass vase than to fix it. In a lot of cases, it's easier to wreak havoc and destruction than it is to prevent havoc and destruction. That's kind of the high level version of the argument, which is that we are just in a rapidly progressing technological era where we are gaining more and more abilities to potentially destroy ourselves. Now, the other part of the argument that I think is more concrete is that we are among the first generations where there are people alive today who were not al- who were who were alive at a time before humans first discovered the ability to destroy ourselves. That's how young the ability for humans to destroy themselves is. I mean, as soon as you say that, I think nukes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So before nukes, okay. there was no. We did not discover any method of eradicating ourselves. Like killing everyone on Earth is actually very hard. As soon as you said, I'm trying to imagine pre-nuclear ways of doing this, and I'm like, well, biological warfare, and then you have. I mean. Yeah. Right. Like. I mean, biological warfare is absolutely a way, but it was discovered after nukes, more, largely, right? A lot of the discoveries in like DNA and, you know, how to... Sure, spoil. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was after... I mean, nukes were the first one, right? Then after nukes, which we barely got out of the Cold War in one piece. And here we are again, so... And here we are, yeah, here we are in a separate situation. So there's... But the the problem is, and, and if anyone wants to read a book about this, I highly recommend The Precipice. I think The Precipice is one of the most important books anyone can read, actually. My point is this, like, if you care about people at all, I don't care what your ideology is, you need to understand the threats that humanity is facing this century. And I think that so few people of any political persuasion are seriously thinking about the ways that humanity could get fucked. And the ways that people usually think about it are kind of like general and vague. It's not just people being like pessimistic and stupid who are saying like Mm -hmm. humanity could destroy itself. It's actually like, there are very, very good reasons to think that that could happen. 
just to talk about some of those, if you want, in addition to the threat of nuclear weapons, which, so I, I guess to take a step back, like, um, there are kind of like, if we're talking about like, what existential risk is, mm -hmm. there are a number of different definitions you could use for existential risk. And it kind of derives from the fact that if all goes well, humanity could exist for a long time. There could be, even if humanity just exists for as long as the average mammalian species, that would mean that less than 1% of the total amount of humans who will ever be born have, have yet been born. That would mean that there could be 100 trillion people in the future. That's just if we live as long as the average mammal. Yeah. That's 100 trillion people. If things go well, that means that there could be trillions of scientists discovering new truths about the universe, trillions of artists making new art, trillions of philosophers, trillions of, of everything that makes humanity great. That is what is at stake. And so an existential risk is, what, is either a risk that threatens to completely kill all people or a risk that basically robs us of our potential, that seriously harms our future potential. And so I think that libertarians need to take X risk extremely seriously because we are actually some of the best equipped people to, to think about and to do serious work on some of the biggest existential risks, not just of the variety of like killing everyone, but actually the variety of permanently robbing us of a like a prosperous free future. One of the biggest risks to our future is, I would say, a stable form of totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. One of my big concerns and something that I do like it is fucking perplexing to me. There are so there's there's so much libertarian. There are so many libertarian resources and so much, you know, there are libertarian nonprofits and institute like educational institutions and research researchers and whatever. And so few of them are thinking about what the future could look like with highly advanced artificial intelligence being used to create a stable totalitarianism. It is already starting to, like, we're already seeing signs that it is possible. We're already seeing very concerning signs. And although there are people who talk about privacy, there are people who are concerned about, like, future technology being used to create a dystopia. I don't see people taking AI as a general risk nearly as seriously as they should. Particularly because if you poll machine learning experts and AI experts, the average response of when will we get AI that will be able to outperform humans on all tasks is about 2060, I think, according to the most recent polling that's been done for just this is just like the top AI researchers. Sweet. I'll be here for that. Probably. Hope I'm yeah, exactly. Trying. I'll do my best. I mean. And the problem with that is that when you have highly advanced capability, we're talking about outperforming humans on everything. Mm -hmm. That includes military strategy. That includes the ability to create new weapons. That includes the ability to mo monitor masses of people. That includes the ability to uh, squash dissent. Mm -hmm. I think you see where I'm going with this. Like, there are just <laughs> like like this is a huge thing. That it is a huge problem. That that is that is literally like we are kind of sleepwalking into as a society, as a world, that I have seen just remarkably little attention coming from people who are you know, trying to study what a freer future looks like. If you're trying to create a freer future, or like, you know, more liberty or whatever, you have to think beyond like 10 years, right? Like think about yeah, yeah. if there's something insane that could happen within four. And by the way, this is just the median estimate, 2060. There are many serious people who think it could be like 2030. This would be the greatest change probably in human history. There are many signs pointing to the possibility that it'll happen within our lifetimes. Many signs pointing to the possibility that the biggest single change in human history will happen within our lifetimes. We are the generations that have to figure this shit out. And so that's kind of my, my thing. You know, with AI, I almost feel like we're too consumed with the far, 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 far off future with AI and ignoring, as you say, the next few decades. So, like, really asinine stuff like Roko's Basilisk, you know? Google that if you don't know. I, I actually haven't read I haven't read that. I have seen that on some... It's, it's Pascal's wager for people who think Elon Musk is God. Like, it's, it's nonsense, I think. Uh -huh. Well, so, I don't know what exactly it claims or what it is. But, yeah, I, I do think that, like, like for AI, I think that some people just like kind of overstate the case in terms of like AI being super important. And that leads many people to be like really skeptical and think that AI is just not a big deal, right? Like, right. yeah, sure. I think that's kind of what you're saying, right? Um, but also just the fact that for, I mean, I like to think about like a singularity, like 
obviously there's plenty of sci-fi about killer robots and they make them look very scary, but there's, you know, your Star Trek and your, your more happy things where, you know, AI is becomes functionally human. And there's always some human who has to, you know, defend the rights of this new artificial intelligence. And so when I think optimistically about literally 500 or a thousand years in the future, when there would be a true sentient AI in, in the sci-fi sense, I think I don't have, I mean, I guess I haven't thought about worrying about it. But what I'm ar- afraid yeah. of facial recognition technology uh-huh, every uh-huh. time I think about putting my face on the internet, yeah. I mean, that is AI. That's the AI Absolutely. we have now. And Absolutely. That's the threat and that's gonna- that is now. And that's the threat that is now, and that's a threat that's going to become more advanced in the near future and is going to become far more advanced than we could even imagine. Like almost almost by necessity, when we're talking about like massive technological changes that could occur, there are going to be things that we fail to anticipate that we can't imagine. Mm-hmm. And that makes it very difficult to kind of prevent some of the you know worst case scenarios, but it means that we need more research. It means we need more people who are like seriously researching a lot of these questions. So like let me just give a, like, there are a lot of scenarios in which AI could go badly, right? Very, very badly for the human species. And, you know, one that I already kind of alluded to was the idea of stable totalitarianism. So mm-hmm. never throughout the history of the human species, we have developed authoritarian regimes throughout time. I think the 20th century saw the first, probably what you'd consider the first totalitarian regimes. Um, although there were some regimes that probably came close before the 20th century. But the totalitarian wet dream, so to speak, was just not possible until today slash the near future, where you can actually develop systems that can monitor and control, certainly monitor everyone's behavior, that you can actually effectively squash dissent, and that you can actually effectively create a stable form of totalitarianism. Like the forms of totalitarianism that existed before were less stable than they have the potential to be in the near future, especially if they are, if, if totalitarian regimes use dangerous tools for, uh, you know, AI assisted dangerous tools. Like, you know, you alluded to facial recognition. That's very important. Think about how much easier propaganda would be if you had a centrally controlled hub of information that could produce any deep fakes that were as convincing as anything you could ever see. So audio deep fakes, video deep fakes, there's so much more that you could convince people to believe under that scenario. Like let's say you have a lot of computational capabilities. Right now, we, right now we're not actually at this point yet. But let's say that the like, computational abilities improve a lot. So like much, many, many more, much more computation can be performed at lower cost. Meaning that you can scrape everyone's public and private data. Because right now it's like, the NSA can look at people's data if it wants to, but it doesn't have like the ability to monitor everyone's data to a severe extent. Or like, you know, we could talk about China as well. I think China. I was going to, I was, I kept thinking of China when we talked about this and they're kind of on the cutting edge. Yeah, exactly. China is, I think way like as, as problematic as the United States surveillance state capabilities are over half of all security cameras on earth are owned by the Chinese government. It sounds so, so much more successfully all encompassing in China. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. And so if we're thinking about, let's just think about China, right? Like China has a billion people. There are not, currently there's not the computational capability to literally keep track of every single private keystroke of every single person at all times where you can, like, you can, you can kind of like record a lot of it, but you cannot, at least to my knowledge, I could be wrong about that. I hope I, I'm, I'm not wrong, but to my knowledge, there's no system that can actually like perform advanced predictions. Let's say that we have highly advanced machine learning that can predict what, um, see a lot of this we already do have actually, like we can predict a a, a lot of persons, a a lot of a person's beliefs uh, based on, you know, what books they read or who they talk to. But I think like, I'm pretty sure that the computational capability to do that at a really sophisticated level for literally every action that a person engages with their phones or whatever, I don't think that computation is possible now. And plus we already like, as scary as a lot of big data is with just like, you know, big tech, which is kind of at the cutting edge, cutting edge of a lot of this stuff, it's still, there's still aspects of it that are very wrong and kind of unimpressive. Like if you just look at like what, especially with people with weird ideologies, it's like, look at what Facebook thinks your ideology is. Uh, (laughs) For a lot of people who are like, I've I've met like anarchists who like Facebook thinks they're moderate or something. It's like, you know, 
like these are really imperfect tools right now. But as time goes on, and especially with governments like China that are actually trying to actively create a literal totalitarian surveillance state, it's just going to become much more possible to have stable totalitarianism if we basically sleepwalk into that future without serious consideration. That could be like the end of of so-called like that could be like the the most stable form of government for the rest of history. And I hate to say that and I hate to think that, but I it's the sort of brave resistance that people like dreaming about, like, you know, the revolutionary fantasies would become literally impossible as that capability increases. Now, that is just one threat from AI. I can I can think of other threats, too. There's a, <laughs> there's there's a lot of um, work that's been done on this. A lot of what I'm talking about is, is basically it's a field. It's known as AI governance. Right. Mm-hmm. It is trying to discover, anticipate and work around the governance issues with respect to artificial intelligence capabilities increasing rapidly in the next few decades. One thing that is very important, and there are even some institutional uh, people within like different uh, nonprofits and different think tanks that are starting to take this more seriously. I think Rand Corp just did a, an analysis of nuclear weapons threats from AI. The first broad threat is like a dystopia, basically stable totalitarianism, not an extinction risk, an existential risk, according to Toby Orr, the author of The, of Pre- of the Precipice, which again, I highly recommend. But another threat is the threat from lethal autonomous weapons. Um, yeah. As as technology improves, as targeting capabilities for like cameras improves, and as radar and the next generation versions of radar improve, it will remove the need for humans, which humans create an inherent inefficiency in any process. Mm-hmm. There is like a certain speed at which we can think. There's a certain level of computation that we're capable of in terms of our decision making. And the problem is that as capabilities of lethal autonomous weapons improve, as they become more deadly, more accurate, more dangerous, if there ends up being some kind of arms race, say between like the United States and China, for instance, like the whole the whole point of an arms race is that each side, because they want to advance capabilities because they're afraid of the other side's capabilities, they will skimp out on safety mechanisms. They'll skimp out on trying to make sure that technologies are developed responsibly or that we saw this with the Cold War. The hydrogen bomb. Yeah, exactly. Oh, like, ugh, don't even get me started. Like that was just absolutely- <laughs> I will get you started about the hydrogen bomb. Fucking insane and gratuitous. Absolutely no Edward reason. Teller. Hate oh, Edward Teller. Oh my God. Teller. So like-, <laughs> like the yeah, so that's that you know, hydrogen bombs are, are an example. And the the thing is, like, imagine next generation nuclear weapons attached to hypersonic oh God, missiles yeah. that are actually the decisions of which are made by AI in a way that is not designed safely or responsibly because each side wants to like further escalate. Of all the things that AI should not be doing, I'd, that's probably the top of the list that I can think of. So, like, like one problem with deterrence, basically, mm-hmm. uh, strategic deterrence, is that. Um, you have to create a credible threat that you will actually use your nuclear weapons. Sure. The biggest failure mode is that someone will miscalculate, someone will fuck up, or that there'll be an accident. Some system will give the wrong signal, and then a nuclear war will ensue. And there are some arguments to be made that certain kinds of AI can actually improve communication and more have more reliable communication between different countries so that they know with higher certainty that they're the other country is not actually using nukes or whatever. I, I, I'm just, I'm they not going to like... They phone for that? I mean, that was what well, they didn't have in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Like, well, you I need mean... actual communication. Well, but with deep fakes, I mean, how, how oh, yeah. like, that can become less reliable, right? So if you could have That's a true. system, if you could have a system that can, like, for example, use AI to verify the status of individual. I don't know, like... Oh, I, no! I, 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 I have a new fear now. I have a just, brand new fear. Well, I'm just saying, like, I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm not gonna like say super confidently that like AI should be completely separate from from nukes, and because oh, there are, I will say, there, <laughs> I mean, there are just there are some ways that I can imagine it might like lead to more stability. But of course, the main point that I'm trying to make is not those cases. The main point I'm trying to make is that there are a whole bunch of cases where it could become way less stable. So like, okay, so category one of narrow AI risk is dystopia. Category two of narrow AI risk is the development of new lethal autonomous weapons. Mm -hmm. Basically the purposeful development of, um, of like drone and like robotics capabilities that can result in mass destruction that's already been developed, it could become way worse, become more arms racy. The third category is actually more specific to nuclear risk in particular, which is that it would result in, so part of what, you know, we were talking about deterrence. 
part of the way that deterrence works, the only actually the only way that deterrence works is if there is a reliable capability for a second strike. So right. it's so it's it's kind of it's, it's it's so weird to talk about this in like technical terms because like in like very you know very like <laughs> measured and 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 um, unemotional terms because we're basically talking about like the possibility of of billions of people dying. But Seven, it's been seventy years of doing it that way though. And yeah, just, and that's and, but but like you kind of have to think about it this way in a, 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 for no other reason than to understand like how the dynamics work and how people think about them, but. Mm. Why doesn't the United States just bomb all of Russia's nuclear weapons, guaranteeing that um, there is no response? It's because they can't. And the reason right. they can't is because of nuclear submarines. So, mm-hmm. like, interestingly, nuclear submarines actually introduced a level of stability that did not exist prior to the development of nuclear submarines. So, it's like, well, I mean, it's just like before the development of nuclear submarines, like, if you think, like, any any country is more likely to bomb another country if they have a reliable if they have reliable confidence that they can take out the other country's nuclear capabilities. That's why even um, moderates want to get rid of the ICBMs that I just visited in Montana, by the way. And you were horrified. visited ICBMs? Well, sort of. Uh, <laughs> I walked to the gate of one and instead of being like, this is interesting. I was like, well, I feel nauseated now. And I bet the government's going to arrest me for looking at this. Oh my God. Nondescript fence. ICBM facilities would be the first thing that you can guarantee any, if there was a nuclear exchange, the first thing you can guarantee would be bombed would be land-based ICBMs. That's why people get rid of those because they'll, they'll use it or lose it, right? The incentive to mm-hmm. use them before they're taken out, mm-hmm. the, the fact that their location is always known. I mean, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. we don't need a triad, guys. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are good reasons. There are definitely good reasons to eliminate the um, the I, the land based plank of the nuclear triad. But plus, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm so like to me. <laughs> my my purely moral outrage is that those things are not on the White House roof. They're in one of the most beautiful parts of America. I mean, yeah. that's that's all I need to know in some ways. Yeah. So, but like, like, but yeah. I mean, returning to the stability point, like, it is true that if all you have is land based ICBMs, then each country has a much much higher incentive to do a nuclear first strike. And in fact, right. there were many members of the U.S. military who were urging a nuclear first strike in all kinds of scenarios because they were like, oh, we'll take out all their ICBMs and we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And what actually introduced stability to that was the nuclear submarine because we don't know the location of it at any given time. Not just submarine, but also uh, I think Russia. I don't know if the U.S. does. I know the, so I know the triad is like it's land, air, and sea, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think Russia also has land-based nukes but they're i think they're roaming nukes so i think they have they're on like trucks or whatever so in that sense their location is not known at any given time okay part of the reason why their location is not known at any given time is because we have not actually mapped the oceans so uh, you hear a lot of people uh, you might have heard people be like oh well we know less about the ocean than we do about like mars or whatever yeah <laughs> and for, I, I don't know. I mean, there's some extent to which that's totally true. I want more scientists to study the ocean. There are all kinds of good reasons to do that. I've, one response I've always had is like, well, isn't there just, isn't there like a whole lot to know about Mars than the ocean? But anyway, um, but part of the reason why we have not like mapped the ocean is because the U.S. and Russian militaries don't want people to map the ocean, like because that could be a, a it is important for stability purposes, for there to be uncertainty. That's kind of the point that I'm trying to make. The uncertainty actually creates and grants stability. If you trust, I'm, I've am i been, people who trust this to work forever, however, I think oh, no, no, no. are it's out of their work. minds. No no, 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 absolutely. I completely agree. It's not going to work forever. Uh, it's absolutely, yeah, it's insane. And but like, we, it, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, was saying, I mean, I was curious, as soon as you mentioned... Um, you were hinting at, at deterrence and just the nuke stockpiles when talking about problems with dramatic change. Like, yeah, I'm gonna, well, let's be anarchists tomorrow. Okay, what do we do with the nukes today and things like that? I was curious what you thought about that. You're obviously more worried about it than your average person, approximately our age. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I believe it's 
Daniel Ellsberg's fault and a few other people's. Okay, so I've had quite a talk with Yusuf tonight, um, and I was going to wrap stuff up with the hopes that he comes on the non-serving podcast again. But before... <laughs> Before I and he wanders off, um, tell us where to find you on the internet um, and some shout outs. Yes, thank you. So yeah, for self-plugging, youtube.com slash C slash Leveler TV. So that's L-E-V-E-L-L-E-R TV. So that is my YouTube. And then if you want to see my writing, I blog on Substack with long-term liberalism. That's long-term is one word and then liberalism. So if you Google long-term liberalism Substack, then you'll find it. Oh, and follow me on Twitter at Yusuf TWT. Serbian podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform? You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.